You just see, you see the whole screen, so that's Yes, nice. correctly, yes. All right, someone's gonna have to give me a hint of how to do this through Zoom. Zoom should let you do that. Um, but why don't I at least get rid of that? Get rid of the inspector, hide inspector, there. All right, I'll do the best I can here. Um, all right, I understand that I'm uh, being translated. So I think I've never done that uh, before. I'm going to try to speak slowly uh, and go through this talk. It's also not an hour, so maybe 30 minutes. And I have plenty of other things I can talk about, but I will, um, hopefully it will go to interactive after I give this talk because there's probably plenty of questions about this. Now I'm trying to figure out how I should see uh, questions, but am I gonna see questions in the chat? Yes, uh, um, um, Kevin Swift will read you the questions after you, you finish the presentation. Okay. So you can answer them. You can also activate the simultaneous interpretation service, the globe icon located at the bottom of the screen. So if there's a question in Spanish, you can hear it in English. Okay, I'm just going to go through the talk and then I'll take questions at the end because I don't Great. See. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about a project that we have uh, recently de proposed, developed, started a little bit of it at, at CADA. CADA is my research group at the University of California, San Diego. It stands for Center for Applied Internet Data Analysis. We have been around about mm, 20 some years. Uh, it's, a, it's a research group at the university and we work with a lot of uh, researchers all over the world, as well as uh, governments and industry folks. So this project is called Knowledge of Internet Structure, uh, Measurement, Epistemology and Technology. And I will start out by saying, I have been really fascinated watching the quarantine happen during this pandemic. I have thought many times that I don't think we would all be home, uh, be able to be home during this pandemic if we didn't have the internet. I suspect that we would be taking a lot more risks to go out and try to keep the economy together. I think we're home because the internet allows us to be home. And it's clear to me now that the internet is not only literally holding society together but saving lives. Now, the focus of this project, however, is what holds the internet together. So the internet actually has some plumbing underneath. I don't need to tell uh, LACNIC this because La the LACNIC community is really part of why the plumbing stays together. But really the plumbing is something we rarely hear about in the media, and yet it's highly vulnerable to misconfiguration and abuse. Uh, and very resistant to, to remediation. So let's talk about the three main key internet systems, naming, addressing, and routing. Naming, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, and I suspect everyone in the audience could tell me a lot more about this than I could tell you, but just to level set here. Uh, the naming system is what maps uh, IP addresses, uh, domain names to IP addresses. Addressing provides addresses for connected devices on the internet and the routing system de determines paths to those addresses. So what can go wrong in each of these layers? Well, the, the mapping between the naming and the name and the IP address can go wrong. Uh, and ICANN has monthly reports on various types of DNS abuse. And one recent report showed almost three quarters of a million domain names associated with abuse. Now, unfortunately, those uh, data and the methodolo methodology for making the inferences about the data are proprietary. So it's hard to validate and it's very resistant to setting policy about the abuse. Uh, let's talk about addresses. And this is all in the, in the scope of the plumbing and how we have to trust the plumbing to have the whole uh, operation work. So addresses are, uh, are for connected devices and the way addresses can be abused. One, one very common way, probably the most common way is you can put a fake source address in a packet, use it to launch attacks, evade filtering policies, impersonate other uh, entities in order to, for example, get them on a blacklist. There was a recent report, it was last year actually, of somebody using a bank's a set of IP addresses and then launching attacks from those IP addresses, spoofed attacks, 
in order to get the bank blacklisted, thus making it impossible to do business, to do online business with the bank. So that's an example of, of abuse of the addressing system. And then routing uh, determines paths to these addresses and yet another subsystem of the internet that uh, lacks certain uh, types of security to keep it robust. Uh, so the routing system has been used to, abuse of the routing system has been used to steal cryptocurrency, generate fraudulent ad revenue. Okay, so underlying theme of this talk, as you may know, especially if you've heard me give a talk before is we cannot secure what we do not understand and we cannot understand what we do not measure. But let's talk about why these problems have persisted for decades. Historically, uh, as many of us know, the internet architecture has academic roots. Uh, fundamentally, it did not assume that there were adversaries in the devices themselves. That doesn't mean that there was no security model of the internet. And indeed, uh, you can read histories of the internet where one of the motivations for the internet was to be resistant to disruption of the network. But it was a different kind of disruption. It was a disruption as in taking a bunch of the internet out. There was no trust, there was no security model that assumed that there were bad guys in the devices. Now, once that threat model was clear that yes, when you release the internet into the real world, there would be adversaries inside the devices, inside the plumbing, let's say. There were a lot of approaches. In fact, the last 30 years, there have been many approaches to try to retrofit security into these layers. But all of these approaches have been largely technically focused, neglecting the political economy, the context in the pol political and economic context in which the solutions would be deployed. They've assumed a global scope of deployment or there would be no benefit or very limited benefit to deployment of the solution. And they've been complex, expensive to deploy, fundamentally architectural changes to try to fix these architectural limitations. These have turned out to be incompatible with reality on the ground, which is low cost operational practices often due to competitive environments for provisioning infrastructure. Some governments that are less focused on security and all governments lack knowledge about, for example, which solutions they should be incentivizing or requiring. I'm gonna skip these, sorry, let me go down here. So it's not that there isn't data about the environment. There, there is data in various places. It's that the environment is knowledge poor and those who have knowledge are generally not incentivized to share it. Okay, so first I should give credit to my co-PI on this project, Dave Clark, who has been developing internet protocols since, the, since they started, uh, was the chair of the internet architecture board in the 80s. Now is the director of MIT's internet policy research uh, or, uh, initiative and recently wrote a book called Designing an Internet after helping to lead an NSF program to uh, foster research, uh, more basic research on what should a new internet look like. Uh, and indeed, what lessons can we learn from the old, old one now that we know what we're building, which people really didn't know back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Well, by the 90s, I suspect they, they all knew. All right, so the, the approach that we propose to take is not to build more technical uh, so, well, there will obviously be technical solutions, but not to focus on specifically an architectural change to the protocols, because they seem quite resistant to change to that kind of change at this point. The solution, rather, we propose is to understand current behavior, use the understanding to inform operational practice, and then enforce the operational practices. So let me give you an example of what I mean by operational practices, the routing system. So as one of the attempts to overcome uh, some of these vulnerabilities, the Internet Society several years ago, I wanna say seven, about seven years ago, and I know this, was, uh, this has been presented at previous LACNET talks, uh, introduced a, a um, let's call it grassroots effort, an, an effort among industry to develop norms for routing security. This was called MANNERS, Mutually Agreed Norms for Routing Security. Essentially what it was, what it is, is a set of best practices, a set of codes of conduct. Uh, the, the details of what is in the code of conduct aren't as important as uh, whether they help and how you know they help. So the Internet Society actually came to us a couple of years ago and asked us, us my research group, CADA, um, can you help us measure uh, the compliance of some of these codes of conduct? It turns out we had one project that focused on the fourth code of conduct, preventing forged traffic. 
So we wanted to look at one, um, can we say that if you comply with the code of conduct, it actually does help? And two, are ISPs complying? Uh, and, and unfortunately what we have, what we found, and I can go into this, it's a whole nother talk, it's a whole nother paper, um, is that those that asserted they were participating with this code of conduct, and you didn't have to assert that you were participating with all of them, uh, but those that asserted they were participating, we did not observe that they were participating any more than the general population of networks. So that turns out to be problematic for a code of conduct because if you assume that those that are, that, are, that are asserting they're complying with the code of conduct are complying and they're not, then you have maybe even a worse sense of security, a worse state of security than if they weren't asserting it because you have a false sense of security. So one of the main things that we learned from that, uh, from that study really informed the development of this project, which is that you really need measurement and derived knowledge to demonstrate compliance with best practices. Okay, so that's maybe easy to say, but uh, the devil is in the details there. So what we're proposing is to develop a project that creates a cycle of continuous improvement because it's not even necessarily okay to measure once. You need to have ongoing measurements that can characterize one normal behavior, distinguish it from suspicious behavior and develop new norms that might, because the norms might change over time. It might be that today you need a certain set of code of conducts to prevent abuse, but you know, attackers are are adaptive. So you're going to need to adapt your code of conducts as well. So you want to be able to identify practices that narrow the opportunities for abuse and then find ways to al align incentives to promote deployment of these practices. But measurement is going to turn out, has always turned out, but now that the internet is more uh, critical infrastructure, especially during this pandemic, you're going to need to measure compliance with the practices. Okay, so why, why do I think we can succeed? <laughs> because really it's not the first time similar things have been tried, but I think now the recognition is that uh, this kind of approach is more critical, more important, and I will argue more likely to succeed because we have international recognition uh, that we're going to need to, we're going to need to uh, treat this, start to treat this infrastructure like the critical infrastructure that it is. Uh, so we also have quite a lot of, of open data now, although uh, we definitely need more once we identify the specific areas, the specific questions and operational practices that are needed to narrow these options for abuse. But I think what we need to move away from is the assumption that we're going to find global solutions to these problems. We're going to have to figure out a way that we can move forward and make progress and measure progress, that is measure that even with non-global deployment of solutions and non-global compliance with practices, you see measurable improvements in security, at least for those that agree to uh, comply with the practices. But I don't believe it can be done without measurement of compliance with the practices. And the spoofer was one example. Okay, so um, this is not a one-shot effort. This is an ongoing process. And indeed, it doesn't succeed if it's not an ongoing process. So our approach is to um, combine parties with many different skills. So in the first year of this project, we uh, had several workshops that included uh, not only technical folks, but government folks, uh, industry folks, and across different uh, disciplines, economists, lawyers, engineers, statisticians. Uh, because the success is really going to depend on being able to integrate uh, different strategies from different disciplines and across sectors. Uh, and again, I'll just say measurement, data, and analysis are critical. Now, the last slide of this part of the talk is that this is, in summary, this project is a path forward to improve the security and functioning of three key but inherently vulnerable systems that underpin all activity on the internet. And really the nugget here is we're trying to change the security landscape from what it is today 
which is, I don't know if you have this word, whack-a-mole, wait for the translation of that word, <laughs> but it's basically a reactive security landscape to a proactive security landscape because we do finally have to start treating the infrastructure, the internet like the critical infrastructure that it is. So I'm gonna pause there and then take some questions, to maybe figure out how the questions work here, open the chat. And then um, I can talk about some other examples of uh, technical pieces of the project we're working on to promote not only that we can make contributions in this space, but to enable others to make contributions in this space because it doesn't work as one research groups or one country or, or, or one anything. Um, Hi, good morning, Casey. This is Kevin Swift here. So far, we do not have any questions for you at the moment, so you can proceed. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, one of the pro projects we're trying to move forward to um, to enable research to uh, expand and science to thrive in this space. And it's a, <clears throat> you can go look at it now, it's a resource catalog where we try to index um, scientific resources about the internet into a rich context catalog. So the goals of the catalog are what? We'd like to make sure that people can find what studies are related to other studies, but also what data sets were used for a given study and how are the data sets related and, and what tools were used for a given study uh, and how are those related? How did others use a data set, a tool or a study so that we can do a better job at building on previous work uh, and also reproducing pre previous work and the other piece that we're trying to add to this catalog that hasn't been in previous catalogs are software recipes or codes to solve problems and uh, guide scientific inquiry. So as an example, and this will, I'll give you an example of what, uh, I guess, in information architecture folks are calling rich context graph. So your, your normal citation graph might cite papers to authors um, but generally is not including aspects like data and software and other media. So here's just a small snapshot of objects that we're connecting together. And then I'll just go into a little technical detail on all of the things you can put into an object field. Um, you have an ID for the object, name, description, uh, user-defined tags, resources, and then of course, um, other type fields you can put into the object. So this will let people index their own um, um, software, tools, platforms, papers, data sets, as well as go grab when they see a data set or when they see a paper, hey, what was, let me go here, hey, what was the software that was used to uh, find the result in that paper? So let me go use it on my own data. Um, uh, or, you know, uh, what, what other tool, what other um, data sets were used there so that I can go run it through my own algorithm or my own tool. So the idea here is to enable, and I'm going to skip to the end here, to enable um, sort of science to evolve faster than it has previously because we have a, a catalog where people can not only go grab um, software data sets and tools and papers, but they can also contribute things uh, as they are ready to. Oh, here, let me go. Um, so here's an example. And again, you can go to this catalog right now and look at um, the objects that are in there, you can give us feedback because this is a very early, early release of this project. Uh, so a data set is a collection of related information. It can be a single file, a database, a collection of files. Here's an example. Uh, a paper can be, well, you know, a paper research report, article, um, and then media can include uh, sort of everything else, videos, visualizations, presentations. Software includes scripts, executables, web interfaces to data, uh, APIs, uh, tools that allow you to share data, but then recipes can be sort of code snippets. So the model here would be like Stack Overflow for internet data science uh, or me methodologies, approaches in order to take a data set and do something immediately useful with it. And part of why we're doing this is, the, ma the main reason we're doing this is we've gotten a lot of feedback from researchers and um, uh, analysts that we have a lot of data now at, on, in CADA as a resource, uh, and there's a lot of data around, but it's actually hard to make intelligent use of the data, especially for students who are not familiar with the data. Generally, they have to go find somebody that's familiar with the data, maybe borrow a piece of code that that person has uh, used to run across the data to you know, convert IP addresses to ASs to routers. 
Um, and so we're trying to lower the barrier for our participation into internet science so that you don't just have to know someone in order to make uh, rapid progress in the field. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop there. Uh, again, I can go into some more technical detail, but I'd, I'd be interested if there's questions or uh, comments, I'm gonna go back to this one. Hi, Casey, yes. Uh, right now we do have a question. Uh, it refers to a point you made earlier. Uh, what are the three key systems? What are they? Yes, if you could give a bit more details, yeah. Right, so um, again, I wanna clarify that I'm, I'm only talking about sort of the plumbing that we think of as under the hood of the internet that we use at the application layer every day. So those three key systems are the naming system, that's what maps your domain name, like <clears throat> www.lacnic.net to IP addresses. That's the domain name system. The addressing system, which provides addresses for connected devices. Now I'm showing IPv4 addresses here. Obviously now today there's IPv6 addresses also. And then the routing system, which determines paths to an IP address once you have the IP address. Okay, Does great. That answer your question? I, I do believe so. Uh, we have another question from Gustavo Morales. I'm going to read the question in Spanish, the original language, so you may want to um, look for the interpretation. Sure. And the question goes, um, ¿existe documentación pública Is sobre there any public documentation on best uh, practices for operational procedures for CCTLDs? That's a good question. <clears throat> I would have to get back to you. I mean, there are definitely best practices associated with operating um, a TLD of any kind that would apply to TLDs as well, or a, re or a registry of any kind. Uh, and in fact, one of the places I would start would be um, the ICANN's Security Advisory Committee, which I'm a member of, and they have been publishing documents for 20 years or so many of which are focused on improving security uh, of registries and registrars. Uh, and there are best practices outlined in many of those documents. So that would be a place to start. Uh, and of course, ICANN itself has lots of material where it's tried to, even though it's, it's sort of contractual focus is not on CCTLDs, it still tries to um, make sure that it's sharing information and training uh, with uh, with, the whole, with the whole community. So many of the best practices for any registry would apply to CCTLDs. And the other folks, and I think he gave a um, keynote at LACNIC a couple of years ago, uh, Hervé from NSRC, the Network Startup Research Center, I think does a lot of training uh, specific to DNS as well as BGP. Uh, in fact, I think they're giving a talk at this meeting on, they're gonna focus on BGP this time, but they also do a lot of training about um, uh, DNS and go around the world talking to various countries. So I would start with those two websites, um, ICANN.org, especially SAC, S -S -A -C, and NSRC.org. Great. Uh, we have another question in English from Matthew Ford. If we are not seeking global solutions to security challenges, what are good possible alternatives, national approaches, network alliances around specific initiatives like MANNERS? Is that it? Okay, thanks, Matt. Hi, Matt. Um, right, <laughs> therein lies the challenge. I think, and this is why I think measurement is going to be key. Um, the, you know, the, as you know, the architecture doesn't know from an IP address generally what, what country it's in. I mean, there are some, some services that can map IP addresses to country, but in general, the packet certainly doesn't know. Um, so I don't, I don't, I think the answer is it's going to be neither global nor nationally focused, at least not specifically nationally focused. I think it's going to be, I think the national governments will end up guiding things as they realize they need, um, they need or their citizens demand some sort of safeguarding so that their use of the internet is more trustworthy. Um, but I think what you'll end up seeing is sub, sub pieces of the internet that, um, you know, zo zones of the internet that agree to certain practices and thereby improve the security for those folks that are, uh, those networks that are agreeing to comply with those practices. Now, 
manners is a great example. Manners is a great um, start. Like the, the great thing about manners is you actually have hundreds at this point of networks who have said, who have sort of at least said this, these are important codes codes of conduct, meaning these are important norms of routing security. Let me go back to the manners if I can find the manner slide. Um, the, the, only, the only gap is that I think, and what we've learned from the Spoofer project is that even those who are trying to be compliant with a norm, in this case, let's say spoofing, because that's the one that we studied. So spoofing is again, putting a fake source address in a packet which is, I would argue, the, the greatest current um, vector for DOS attacks on the internet because it's operationally, practically infeasible to trace the attack back to its source. It's not always in, impossible, but in general. So by allowing your network to send spoof packets, you are creating a vulnerability for the whole internet. Right now, so the spoofer, what is the spoofer project? That is helping networks solve this problem for the rest of the internet by configuring that, because the only, as, as has been concluded 20 years ago, the only real solution to this problem is you have to stop net packets leaving your network that have fake source addresses. You have to take responsibility as the network owner that packets leaving your network will, um, will have source addresses that you own in them. So what's the problem with that? One, well, it doesn't really help you as the network owner to be doing this. It's, it's the ultimate incentive incompatible um, practice because if you do it wrong, and this has been well documented, it's possible that you do damage to your network. You may cut off a customer if you do it improperly. So, and it, and it can be tricky in certain networks, complicated networks to get the configuration correct. So the incentives are all against doing this unless there were some, and, and I'll, Maybe I can bring up another uh, slide deck that talks about this in detail, but there's a whole talk about spoofer as a challenge in a, in a, a practice of network hygiene to sort of get it right. So Manners put this um, code out there as one of his code of conducts, but it didn't have a way to measure. Now, it turns out even ISPs who absolutely believe and absolutely have put time in um, to make sure that their uh, configuration is correct. Sometimes it's not correct. It's a tricky thing to get correct. And if you upgrade your router, any router or your software in your router, potentially, it could become incorrect. Um, in fact, one of the big uses of our spoofer project has been networks using it to remediate, that is correct the configuration in their own network so that they are compliant. Networks have told us that it is clear from the data that we see in, in our log files that networks are using this platform in that way. So even the networks themselves need measurement, and sometimes it's difficult to measure these things from from in, from a given perspective. You need multiple perspectives. Uh, although spoofing in particular, you need the perspective inside the network, and you need something outside the network to see if the spoofed packet gets outside the network, right? Um, so even the networks need mechanisms for measurement of compliance. Now, of course, what is more important though, or as important is that a third party can measure compliance, say someone who wants to provide insurance to this entity. And maybe they wanna know, well, before I provide insurance, I wanna know, is that network taking precautions to protect their network and protect themselves from liability? Should they be the source of attacks on other networks? Uh, but insurance companies can't. I mean, nobody can, as a third party, identify whether a given network has implemented that particular practice correctly. Uh, you, can, you can verify that they've implemented it incorrectly if you get a packet that is spoofed from that network. But that turns out to be not what most people want. Most people wanna know is the, is the practice implemented correctly. So to answer Matt's question, I think that you, what you will probably end up with on a network by network basis. That is, what can we measure about improvements in security? And then use that to sort of create zones of, okay, all of these networks like Manners. Like if Manners had measurement of compliance attached, you would have a set of networks that you know are more trustworthy to do business with on these dimensions. 
So, uh, and indeed you have now equivalent movements starting on the DNS side to create sort of codes of conduct or operational best practices to prevent abuse or increase robustness on the DNS side. So I think that, you know, this is not an original idea. Like people are trying to move in this direction, but the measurement is complex. So that goes back to this is sort of an ongoing challenge. Um, let me do this one uh, because you know, what, first of all, it turns out to be tricky just to characterize what is normal behavior. And in order to define, okay, this is an operational practice that will prevent uh, abuse or prevent suspicious activity that is likely to be abuse, you have to understand enough about the operation, the transactional behavior between networks, between operators on the DNS side, on the BGP side to know what should you even decide, uh, what should you infer as suspicious versus normal. So, you know, all of this requires a, a cycle of continuous improvement, but I, I don't think the answer is going to be certainly not only on the national level, although I do think uh, governments of the world have a role to play. Uh, really, the problem is I think some governments are already trying to play the role and they're underinformed. Like the governments need more measurement too, and they don't even know exactly what to measure or what to ask, ask data for data about. So this is a, a slow process. Okay. Um, Matt, ask another question if that didn't answer the question. Right. Thanks, Casey. We have another security-related question. It's in sure. Spanish from Eduardo Preve, so I'm going to read it. Eduardo, uh, Eduard Preve says, um, is it possible that in the future we may have two internets? One will be secure, certified, that complies with the manners, practices, and the other one vulnerable, more insecure, of insecure sources. Um, it's such a political question, but you know, it's kind of a political uh, time. <laughs> uh, I think you, I think you already have multiple internets. I think you already have trust, more trustworthy networks, networks that are really trying to be more trustworthy. And I'm going to, I'm going to just share one more talk here, um, and less trustworthy. The problem is we don't know which is which, right? So, um, I think that really you're going to find a, now, let's see, this didn't, I meant to stop. Oh, there we go, yeah. You're gonna find the need to um, move forward in this way, to sort, of de to, to sort of demonstrate the trustworthiness of given networks or increasingly sensitive networks aren't gonna wanna interconnect with those networks. So I think it's not that you're going to have uh, two internets. Um, I don't. I can't. I can't predict that. Uh, I think again. I would. I would argue that you already have. You already have multiple internets. You already have multiple networks. Uh, maybe the question is, are you going to have two? You know, two namespaces. And and again, depending on who you ask, you already have multiple namespaces. So, I, I, obviously, there's an incentives to try to keep as much in the the namespace we all know and as the ICANN rooted uh, DNS namespace and the incentive to do that needs to include an incentive to keep it tr as trustworthy or make it as trustworthy as we can make it. So I guess the answer to your question is part of the reason that I am pushing on this idea that Dave and I are pushing on this idea as well as, and I don't know if I included the list of, um, of partners that we have on this project, uh, is that we would like to retain as much single zone of, let's call it trust that we can, but it really can't be done without a completely different approach to measurement and open knowledge about the network. The network, really the network structure and how things relate to each other. What are the trust dependencies? How can we verify that the networks are operating in ways that are, com are compatible with trustworthy and trustworthy behavior? Does that answer it? Yes, I believe so, Casey. Uh, we have another question that's more general. Um, it comes from Luis Bolaños, and I shall read the question in its original language, Spanish. So please um, have your interpretation ready. Para un ISP, teniendo documentación sobre el tráfico cursado. Uh, for an ISP, having documentation on uh, cursed traffic and current users and uh, short-term users estimation, is there a statistical model that uh, may pre uh, predict the use of uh, bandwidth and equipment, among others? For this type of studies, what are the data are absolutely necessary? 
Whoa, I'm not sure that I understood the question. So I'm going to try to say it back and then the poor translator has to do this again. Um, is there data to enable prediction of available bandwidth of somebody else's network? Is that the, is there data or tools or models to enable prediction of, of available bandwidth or capacity? Oh, wait. Yes, that's the question. Um, so <laughs> there is research in that area, which you can Google to find. Um, it's, a, it's a tough problem. I think, and part of part of the challenge with traffic modeling is access to data that will enable you to validate, inform, and parameterize the models. So I think the answer is networks that have a lot of data already, that have a lot of their own traffic data, um, and can sort of refine models as they go, probably have uh, decent models that inform their traffic engineering. Uh, and I would, I, I'm not sure how rigorously to Im imply, I, I don't know how rigorous the model would be. I think there's a lot of probably AI, you know, machine learning sort of approaches to doing the traffic engineering now. It's not my area, but I know there are a lot of papers in, in conferences that I participate in on traffic modeling and even trying to estimate available bandwidth. Um, but it's it, in terms of scientific traffic models that would be general for general purpose use, no. I don't think so. And again, I think the real block, it, this isn't like the world of telephony back a hundred years ago, let's say maybe not that long, 80 years ago, where one, you had uh, relatively compared to today, simple um, dynamics on the network. I mean, every transaction was a single 64 kilobits per second um, channel that was up for the duration of the phone call. You don't have anything like that. So you don't have any simple model like an airline distribution on today's network. Um, and the second problem is that you don't have mechanisms for really sharing data in a way that can enable that sort of scientific uh, progress to be made, at least again, available to the general public. Okay. We have another question here from Carolina Caero in English. And it goes, how can measuring the internet help monitor attempts to curtail rights and freedoms online? How can network operators contribute to protecting the open internet? Right, um, these are great questions. So I would say measuring the internet is the only way to monitor attempts to curtail rights and freedoms online. Uh, in fact, you have the word monitor in the same question, uh, which is eff effectively measurement, right? Uh, and, and all the people that I know that are studying internet censorship or, well, let's have censorship bro broadly defined are using measurement to do so. The question is not how to, the question is not, well, as you say, the question is how to best measure such a thing. And right now I think you're, the, the field is moving forward as it can based on the access that it has and the ability to validate that what when it measures something that it thinks is a censorship or just dis, intentional disruption of the internet to prevent communication, that it's actually, it's, it's, it validates that inference. Because one of the um, challenges of internet science is there's a lot of false positives. Uh, there's a lot of noise in the network that's very difficult to interpret accurately and soundly without ground truth, let's say validation from those who do know exactly what's going on. And especially in the space of um, right, ac rights to access information, that's difficult to obtain. Uh, no, wait, there was a second question. It just went away. And I say the second part of that question again. Oh, how, how can ISPs contribute to the open network, I think? Yes, um, how can operators contribute to protecting the open internet, yeah. Yeah, you know, open internet is also a pretty generic term. Uh, so I think obviously uh, ISPs uh, can, you know, not not uh, filter, not censor traffic. But the, the reason this gets so politically loaded is that you really don't want a completely unfiltered uh, set of traffic coming to your machines. <laughs> uh, in fact, this is why many, many people have moved to uh, using email addresses that are behind large cloud providers because the large cloud providers can be very effective at scale at filtering spam out. 
right? And spam and spam and email is just as symbolic of the kinds of garbage that comes to uh, all all um, hosts on the internet. There's just a lot of noise and much of it malicious, much of it trying to infect your machines. So the the uh, balance there is you want to filter the bad stuff, but you don't want to filter the good stuff. And that turns out to be a value judgment. How do you know what's bad and how do you know what's good? And so again, this was a very good motivation for the project here of we get through this with open knowledge. We get through this with um, mechanisms for not only gathering data, but sharing data while still balancing the needs for privacy of users. So I'm not saying those problems are easy to solve, but I'm saying like the first step is to acknowledge, okay, these are the problems and here's how pieces of them have been solved and what can we learn from trying to solve those pieces. So and as an example, the, um, the US government set up a project about 14 years ago to try to foster sharing of sensitive cybersecurity data among between academic researchers and um, in industry uh, to try to at least address without regulation, but just address the the difficulties, the challenges involved with sharing that kind of data, with sharing any data that is sensitive, but cybersecurity related data about networks. And one of the contributions, I think the lasting contributions that that project made was to put all of its um, data sharing agreements. So these are legal agreements for how to do protected data sharing. Now, obviously they're US language, US legal system focused, but there is some commonality around the world with what you're trying to protect against with sharing data. And so they put all of these agreements online. So anybody can take that agreement, adapt it, translate it and use it to try to push forward the, the challenge of, of data sharing. Okay, another question coming in from Augusto Madurin in English. What are the key aspects to measure in order to evaluate how developed is the routing infrastructure and ecosystem in a country or region? That's a great question. We, we like that question. Actually, we're working on several different aspects of that question. So, um, well, developed is a tricky word because you, by developed, you might mean how much uh, bandwidth there is and measuring bandwidth, as I mentioned earlier, is a, is a tricky aspect. We don't try to measure bandwidth remotely from a, um, across the network. But if you're just talking about connectivity, like how many different paths uh, cross a different cross a, a country or land or, or go end in a country. How many different ways are there to get from one uh, region to another region? Then you can. There's a lot of data available to do uh, reasonable scientific work in that area. You're, it's not complete. You're never going to get complete uh, connectivity maps of the internet, but there's a lot. You can get pretty comprehensive maps. And I'll mention route views. Uh, in the US, RIPE, RIS, I, I know that RAR community is probably quite familiar with these projects, but th that allows you to look at BGP connectivity between networks where networks, again, announce into the global routing system their connectivity to some extent with other, with other networks. The other thing you can, and so that gives you in inter-network connectivity. It doesn't necessarily tell you what's happening inside a given network. And that can be where a lot of redundancy or you know, diversity in connectivity is achieved inside a network. Like there might be multiple paths from uh, the US to Brazil, but they're within a single network. So you wouldn't see it at the BGP level. Uh, so the other, th the other source of, the other aspect to measure would be uh, trace route data, using trace route data, which is you, know, you initiate a packet, a set of packets, you to try to infer the forward path at the router level or let's say IP address level, and then you can use tools to help you infer router connectivity from the IP inferred connectivity. Um, uh, and, and one of the project, several of the projects that we've done have been to try to compare what you see at the router level with what you see, what you see at the BGP level, the inter, uh, the routing, let's call it the signaling path where networks tell each other about connectivity uh, that they want to announce versus the uh, data plane level where traffic actually goes if you send a trace route packet from one part of the network to the other. And if you use both of those uh, sources of data, you can get a, a, a richer ability to measure how developed the routing infrastructure is. Now you mentioned ecosystems. So that's that also means I, I assume like peering 
uh, interconnection inside a country. And actually one of our postdocs, Roderick Fano, did a, did a study uh, with the ISOC support on interconnection development in Africa, uh, again, using BGP data. Uh, so similar to, similar to, I mean, the data that RIPE and, and route views collect. Uh, and I have long wanted, so here's a challenge for some um, bright student in Latin America who wants to take this on. I've long wanted that study to be replicated in the Latin American region to help track IXP um, or interconnection, not necessarily at an IXP, but interconnection um, evolution in the region. And if anyone's interested, send me mail after the talk and, and I'll point you at where we, you could start such a project. Great, thanks Casey. We have one last question, uh, fan favorite I would say. What exciting and new projects is Kaido working on? And that will be the last question because we are close to wrapping up. Oh my gosh, okay, so uh, I mentioned one, maybe it's not so exciting because sometimes the, the, really, the most important projects are not as exciting, but the, um, uh, the catalog project uh, is, is the hopefully going to be a piece of the infrastructure that enables us to move forward with this open knowledge uh, project that we're starting. So I would say the open knowledge network, which tries to gather enough BGP data and DNS data together to create um, to understand what the baselines look like and therefore what, what hopefully what suspicious behavior looks like in order to move toward, okay, is this suspicious behavior that actually is associated with uh, real attacks, real abuse, and should we try to create operational practices that minimize or mitigate the impacts of this suspicious behavior? Um, so the, the Kismet project is uh, the most exciting. That one we're still trying to get off the ground here. Uh, but we have a couple of papers that we're publishing in the Internet Measurement Conference this year. One on, <clears throat> three, I think, four. We have one on um, the discovery of many, many lame delegations on the Internet that are sort of inadvertent result of operational practices in the registrar or registry community. So, and that workshop will be, that conference will be next month, uh, and the papers will be online. Uh, as well as online on Cato's website. And it, that, paper, that one paper is called um, Unresolved Issues, the Perils, Persistence, and Prevalence of, or Prevalence, Persistence, and Perils of Lame Delegations on the, in the DNS. And then we have another paper that's using AnyCast and AnyCast deskbed to try to infer whether IP addresses on the, uh, generic IP addresses on the network, but focused on DNS because AnyCast is a specific technology often used to improve the resiliency of DNS services, especially authoritative servers. Well, not just all, all DNS servers. Um, and so it turns out to be tricky to measure, to, to measure in general whether a given de DNS deployment is AnyCast. And so some colleagues in Holland at Twente uh, and uh, UCSD have come up with mechanisms for sort of inferring at scale, sort of doing a census of the of IPv4 space on whether IP addresses are anycast. Um, and then we're also working with Waikato, uh, Matthew Lucky at Waikato on some very interesting work trying to infer structure from host names, I, IP host names. And you may have seen some email fly by the Nanog list asking for validation because always important to our research topics is uh, can we get ground truth validation from operators? And I, I wanna thank all the operators who help us so much with this perennially challenging task. So I'll stop there, but we also have an annual report on our website, 2019 annual report went up recently and that goes through all of the projects very quickly. So it's a very efficient way to <laughs> learn about the work that Kate has been doing in the last, the last couple of years. And I want to end, and again, the Spoofer project uh, is another recent project that uh, we published in, I'm going to give you the URL for this. We published in uh, CCS in 2019, and there's some really nice work at the end on, you know, incentives for um, uh, moving the needle, as we call it, or internalizing uh, negative externalities in the space of operational practices, which has been the theme of this talk. Thank you very much, Casey. Would you like to share your email in case the participants want to contact you? Yes, let me do it. Let's see, am I sharing? 
I can't tell if I'm sharing anymore. Maybe well, you email, can, yes. Two letters, KC, and then uh, kda.org works or ucsd.edu, my university.